Welcome to another episode of 30 Minutes with DailyStraits.com. Our guest today is Kate Meets of Waste Free with Kate & Co. Kate's business is centered around waste education management. Kate's crusade in the waste education started as a first-time mom wanting to save money through her cloth napping importing business in 2006. Inherently, she began to understand the waste and reduction benefits that reusable nappies had to offer. She ran what was to be her first parenting workshop in 2007 on reusable nappies in Hamilton who were seeing when an alarming statistics at landfill level from single-use nappies. In 2013, Kate sold and stepped away from her online reusable nappy business and the nappy lady to focus solely on waste minimization education. Fast forward to this year, 2021, Kate is now a consultant, a keynote speaker and a motivational speaker for waste medi- minimization education which sees her presenting her ideas to over 30 to 500 uh, people in a session. This year, Kate uh, talks to close to thousands of people via community engagement programs, keynote speaking, and business motivation programs. Her change enabler business has expanded to include an additional skill educator leading to a rebrand last year to her current company, which is Waste Free with Kate & Co. So without further ado, let's invite Kate to the show and ask her all things about her waste education business. Hi, Kate. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. Awesome. So we'll just dive right into the question. So can you just take us back to 2006? What was the reason or interest that sparked your um, yeah that sparked you to come into this crusade of waste education management? Um. So what happened was I had a baby, uh, and when I had my son, I started realizing how many disposable nappies we were going through, and uh, um, it was because with newborns, he was going through about 12 to 15 nappies a day. So over a week, the bin was filling up quite, quite severely, actually. <laughs> you know, before a baby was in the house, we had one small bag of rubbish a week and then introduce a baby and it was a giant wheelie bin going out every Friday. Um, and so it sort of got uh, got to a point where I, I just became aware of how much rubbish there was and also how much it was costing me, which was about $45 a week just to to buy nappies and then throw them away. And so as part of that, I started doing a little bit of looking into cloth nappies and um, originally set up the business with my friend Paula and we, which was called Nappy Days. And we imported um, cloth nappies from Australia and Scotland. And um, uh, I brought Paula out about a year into it and uh, sort of went more full-time myself. But the, the, the big change for me was just actually noticing the amount of rubbish and I thought well I'm one parent um, and and I'm putting out you know 100 plus nappies a week and there's 145,000 babies at any one time in nappies so how many are going out a day Um, and it turns out in New Zealand the figures are about a million single use disposable nappies a day go to landfill so that for me was a big a big motivator to start encouraging other parents to start looking at, at cloth nappies not just to save money which was my starting point but also to save the waste okay so were you working um, and doing this on the side or were you a full-time mom by that Uh, I was definitely working so um, at the time uh, my son's father and I were running a workshop so we had a car mechanics workshop so I literally had my son um, on on a Saturday when I wasn't working and I was back at work on the on the Tuesday so um, that was um, you know good old self-employment and so yeah I was working for time basically in the workshop doing um, the accounts and things and then started this business on the side um, you know in my not so spare time <laughs> okay and um, what was the um, like you said you got your stuff from Scotland and Australia in those like 2006 how did you get all the suppliers did you go to the internet and source the um, you know the suppliers from Australia and uh, Scotland or you had friends who have uh, you know, who had this kind of um, cloth nappy that they could send to you? No, well, we we actually originally brought a couple just to try. Um, hadn't hadn't even thought about setting up a business at that time. Just brought a few cloth nappies to try, and then found there were two particular brands that we really liked. So we decided to start selling them, and then I think it was about uh, twelve or or may, it might have been nine or ten months later, we became distributors for the brand in New Zealand. How did you find the brand? Um, there was just from trying 
bring them. We brought them for, on a on a website in Australia and got them sent over and liked them. So that's how we originally found them. Yeah, because there oh. wasn't much around then. Like nowadays, there's like hundreds and thousands of brands, but back then there was around the world maybe ten brands. Awesome! And then you became dis- distributors for the thing, and then um, and then how did the business um evolve into a parenting workshop? Because you started having workshops then teaching other parents to follow suit, right? Yeah. So my biggest thing, I suppose, um, was that there was a real lack of information around um, around cloth nappies and what was available because everybody thought it was the big old flat nappies with pins and fluffy pants. But the modern nappies that started coming out were quite quite fancy and and real easy. No no, um, you didn't soak them. You didn't um, like there were, there was no bleaching or anything like that. It was just like chuck them in the machine and away you go. Mm-hmm. So at that time. Um, I wanted to help other parents see what was available. Mm-hmm. So we um, did a, a, applied for some funding to run a, a cloth nappy workshop. And back then the councils were really interested in the waste figures mm-hmm. because nappies and sanitary make up between 8 to 14% of the domestic waste collected every week. So they were interested in reducing the amount of disposables going to landfill. So we um, got the first uh, like tiny amount of funding from Hamilton City Council because it was so new back then and um, just decided to try and educate them but we what we'd done was try and work with a whole bunch of other brands so that we would take samples of all the brands in and be able to show the parents all the different styles of brands mm-hmm. so that they could because I mean even for me like yes we were bringing in two brands into New Zealand but they don't like with cloth nappies they don't always sort of suit every single baby so it was just trying to give people the the just the advice on what's available it wasn't even about like for us it wasn't about selling nappies it was just about getting people to know what was there so was it a business by then when you had your first parenting work parenting workshop sorry or was it just a side thing no it was definitely a business by then and with the workshops i was working with about four other brands in new zealand at, right at the start to um yeah just to promote cloth nappies so it was very unbranded unbiased um sort of advice and was it uh, how many people turned up for the first workshop do you remember oh there was probably five <laughs> <laughs> Five what very enthusiastic it? parents. <laughs> wow, and you evolved, you know, you've become a juggernaut since. So how did you, um, what was the first, was it Was it free? Because it was funded, it was free, right? Yeah, so back then it was, it was definitely free. Um, and then what happened was we started wanting to be able to get people um, access to cloth nappies to, to try and get some of the councils to fund them. So um, that's, that's when I became the nappy lady. Mm-hmm. which is still weird um, but I because I was getting a lot of TV interviews I was doing a lot of um, advocacy and working with a lot of the other brands and um, so I started running more and more workshops around the country and we came up with a, a scheme which we still sort of do today with some of our parenting workshops where um, to to get parents past the barrier of cost because it does cost to buy cloth nappies but to get them past that barrier and try them them, we um, worked with the councils to get subsidised packs mm-hmm. so the people would pay say 20 or $25 and then working with all the brands we would make it the person paid $25, the council paid $25 and the person got $100 worth of stuff. So the brands gave it to us for 50% off because it was like an ad- advertisement for them. The council's half funded <clears throat> the other 50% and then the person's ticket cost covered the other half of the 50%. So they'd go home with $100 worth of nappies to try. Oh, great. So by this time, was Paula still in the picture or she had? No. <laughs> no, she it was a bit like she had her first son, Max, and then we started the business. And then um, it was only about four or five months later, she was pregnant with her second. <laughs> so um, um, she continued on for a few months 
months, but then she was just like, I can't do this with two kids. <laughs> so, um, so I brought her out. Yeah. So you yeah. did business. So you were selling, um, what was the online business about? You were selling uh, re- reusable nappies, cloth yeah. nappies? Yeah. So we had the, bra- the business that, well, I had the business that was selling cloth nappies. Mm-hmm. And then I set up the nappy ladies. So it was completely separate from the business and provided really unbiased advice because I really didn't, for me, um, I wanted to get all of the brands to work together because the way I put it years ago was like we were all fighting over about 4% of people who were using cloth nappies. So the pie, we had this tiny wedge we were all fighting over. And so what I did was propose to them that by working together and I sort of took took a sidestep from my business and had somebody managing that to go more into the nappy lady because I was like, well, let's, let's grow our portion of the pie that we're fighting over by working together instead of us all individually fighting for a very small percentage of people let's get more people using them and then fight over that instead <laughs> oh so the nappy lady is a like a workshop kind of awareness business right yeah yeah it was very much advocacy for cloth nappies yeah awesome and i just want to take you back a bit do you remember the initial investment you put in to start your business um back then i think because we had to build a website it wasn't cheap back then either building websites um i think we both put in about two two and a half thousand dollars each to get our first order in um and then as we built the website i think our first website cost us something like fifteen thousand dollars um and then on top of that so when i brought paula out i i had to pay her back um i think it was about twenty thousand mm-hmm. from the from memory um because she put up the money for the website and then I was doing a lot of the admin. So I was sending out all the orders and she paid for the website. So yeah, I brought her out. Yeah, it was about $20,000. Awesome. Okay. And um, you had no business plan, right? You just went with a gut feeling to start this? Uh, no, well, that's where I was lucky because Paula was um, very much into business plans. So <laughs> she came up with this amazing, I'm not the business plan person. I'm the, I'm the creative, like, let's do this, let's do this. I've got this idea sort of person, but she sort of brought it back to a, um, it was about a 54 page business plan where she'd done a lot of market research. Um, she was a re- research scientist. So that was right up her alley. So she wrote this amazing business plan, um, which I used for quite a few years, actually, for my, like, just going forward on, like, keeping on on with what was happening and what was changing and who to work with and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, so it was quite a formal start, really. <laughs> oh, all right, so you went up to 2013 doing, were you alone or did you have staff with you by the time Bob um, uh, I started with staff probably, I had one lady, um, Karen, who worked for me very part time, like maybe came in one day a week to help me process the orders. And then I had another lady because she had another child. And then I had another lady who came and she worked for me for, for a few years doing part time. And then when I took the nappy lady sort of next level, I had two part time sort of staff working at different in different areas. Um, and now I've I've got one full time uh, staff member in my and one part-time sort of sort of it does the hours that she needs to but we were very flexible like you know come to work do what you need to do go home work from home whatever you like so it's a real sort of cruisy works work work environment yeah great so what happened in 2013 like you know you sold the business because did you find it hard to manage or you know you got sick of it or to be honest um the main reason that i sold it was because like we would go and do baby shows and because i had such a profile as the nappy lady i wouldn't be on my stand at all because i didn't want people to feel that because I was on this I didn't want people to even know what brand was mine so I would I could didn't feel comfortable being on the stand because then I felt like people would think that they were the best nappies and um and I wanted people to have choice so I 
I would spend most of the weekend off the stand um, so that people didn't see me on the stand because I, I was so, I once I stepped into that that sort of advocacy role, I really wanted it to be a fair playing field for all brands. I didn't want them to sort of put their trust in me and then feel like they were being taken advantage of, which was probably for me um, quite like, uh, it was, I, I ethically, I couldn't do it. So I needed to sort of hang back. But then it got to a point where I just realised I didn't like him important distribution <laughs> so I was like I'm happy to sell that part and just try something else because I um I hated debt I hated having um like we would order thousands and thousands of pounds worth of nappies and then the, having to pay for them up front and wait for them to get here by ship and then um and then sell them but by the time they got here you'd be basically ordering more and then I, I just felt like I was always in debt and I did I didn't like that feeling so I was happy to step away from that <laughs> So you mentioned pounds just now. I, I take it you're British. Are you British? No, no, no. But because we were getting them from Scotland, we had to pay oh. in pounds. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I learned, a, I learned a lot. I learned a <laughs> lot that I never knew. Like I'd never done anything like that before in my life. So it was trying to find companies that I, I didn't even know how to import anything. So it was quite a learning curve um, because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> So, yeah. All right. So who did you sell it to? And was it easy to find a buyer? Um, yeah. Well, when I was ready to sell, sell, I just told a few people and we straight away had somebody who was interested. So it was a distribution company that brought it. And yeah. And then since then, it's been on sold to another young couple who run it now. Um, and I haven't met them. So I'm not, I, I don't know who they are really. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, one, uh, for me, it was, I love, like I loved the business and I loved everything that I'd built but I was ready to step away from it um, just because I just couldn't I couldn't honestly well, I, I just couldn't sell the nappies um, being in the position that I'd put myself in you know so I had to have other people doing it for me <laughs> Yeah. Do you want to, can you, was it a good uh, sale? Was it what you wanted? Like, um, Not really. No, I mean, at the end of the day, I was just ready to get out. Mm -hmm. So I sold it for, I can't even remember the figure now. Um, but I, I was basically the stock uh, value plus, I don't know, it might have been ten or 15,000. I, I can't even, I can't even remember. It's been that long ago. Um, yeah, but it wasn't, it was, I didn't make a fortune out of it, that's for sure. What did you sell? The nappy lady the and also the online business, which was um, distribution of uh, cloth nappy, right? Is that what yeah, you Yeah, so I just sold, I sold the distribution business and um, yeah, but I, I kept the nappy lady because um, that was still part of the advocacy. I'm still sort of funny because people still call me the nappy lady now, but because I do such a diverse range of work, it's sort of weird if you're going and doing a workshop on food waste and they're introducing you as the nappy lady. <laughs> 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 okay, but you man managed to um, pivot quite successfully into education and now um, you're doing like waste minimization education. So how did that come about? And you give workshops throughout the country and you're pretty famous as well. I mean, you've been on TV and stuff like that. So how did you rebrand yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a challenge. Um, it's over the years, it's been trying to decide what, because I'm very, um, what I would call a mainstream greenie, I suppose. I, I'm not, I never claim to be perfect. And so I really wanted to portray that we're not a, a perfect company. So we've gone through a few name changes trying to work out what, what, what we were. <laughs> um, because the councils years ago, what happened was I was doing nappy workshops. So that was still pretty predominantly my business back in 2013. Um, and then I had, there was a campaign that came in called Love Food, Hate Waste, mm -hmm. um, which must have been in about 2016. Yeah, 2015, 2016. And um, one of the councils asked me to, if I would do a food waste workshop. So um, I created some new content to, to run a food waste workshop, workshop and called it, because again, like if you just say, oh, I'm doing a food waste workshop, nobody's going to come. So we called it a food lovers masterclass and mm. created a whole workshop on on um, like why we waste food and what the waste main wasted foods are. So I created that and then that sort of took off and 
quite a few councils picked that up as a part of their education program. And then it was probably in about 2018, 2018, um, we started, we just started doing other workshops. So we just started a waste free living workshop. And then we were getting asked to go and do like speaking at schools and talking to students. So we just went and talked about rubbish. Um, and then, yeah, it's just sort of growing and growing. And then we started having corporates asking us to come along. So we developed some corporate courses. Um, I still do most of the education myself. So it keeps me on the road quite a bit. But um, yeah, recently, um, or it must have been the beginning of last year, um, I got one of the girls who works for me, she was really keen to start doing presentations. So she started doing the odd one and now she's sort of doing quite a few for me as well. How do you keep yourself up to date with knowledge and what kind of knowledge do you impart in your workshop? Like, do you read a lot? Like, or do you go conferences for, your, from, for yourself? Do you attend a lot of overseas conference? Where do you get the... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, actually. Um, I most of it I've learned just through my journey. So just I talk a lot. So I talk to a lot of people and um, and just gain knowledge from them about what's going on. Um, we work with around 40, 44, 45 councils at the moment. So, you know, whenever we're there working for them, we're getting up to date information. I've got a lot of good contacts in the industry who give us up to date information. So we keep it quite current um i don't i attend the normally the new zealand conference here on waste minimization but um i, I mean most of the stuff uh, i've i've heard already before i get to the conference so um it's not those sort of things haven't helped my knowledge um i used to read a lot but i don't have time now <laughs> um it's just basically just being just being part of conversations and learning what the problems are and and for me I'm fascinated in in the behaviour change of people like how to get somebody to um, who knows nothing about recycling and and has never done it properly to change their behaviour to do it properly. So for me it's probably quite a strong personal uh, interest in what what makes people tick. Why do people uh, why should people attend your workshop? Because you know a lot of people would rather go and see a concert or something like that but why do people <laughs> attend your workshop can you give us a, like a pitch <laughs> um well i mean most most of the people who come to my workshops are people who know they want to make a difference um but don't know where to start and like that's where the parenting workshops are, have always been quite a strong a strong part of what we do because uh parents are going into a totally new time in their lives with a new baby coming into the house so they're educating themselves quite heavily on all their options and what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. I mean, I, I feel quite lucky that we never had Google pregnancies when I was pregnant, you know, because I feel sorry for the parents of today who Google everything. Um, but uh, yeah, we, I think that it depends on what, what journey somebody's on because if they're on if they're becoming parents then they're on a journey to find out a lot of stuff around what how they're going to bring up their child so the waste free parenting workshop is always quite popular um because there's a definite target market the other ones are quite diverse um and it is a night out like we use uh we a lot of the people come because they hear from a friend who's been once before who um enjoyed it and i like to use a lot of humor i don't like you know there's nothing worse than sitting to start listening to somebody who's boring um so i do use a lot of humor in my workshops and make it as fun as possible um and you often get people at the end who are like oh man i thought two hours was going to be a long time but you know it goes really fast so that's the sort of stuff we want to hear but it's just um yeah, the, the the goal we set for this year was to work more towards reaching the unreachable people because we know that with some of our workshops, people will come along because they're already sort of semi or interested in waste minimization or what's going on in the planet. Um, for us, it's more the stuff that we're working on currently is, is around like reaching the unreachable people. How do we get the people who have no idea why they need to do 
do it properly, like just even starting to think about what they could do um, to make a difference. So you have a very interesting journey from a humble nappy to a juggernaut in waste management. So I was just wondering, have you have plans to write a book on waste? <laughs> I get asked all the time. Yeah, I'd love to write a book, um, but unfortunately, because the borders are closed, I'd love to go and sit on a tropical island and write a book for 10 days. Um, but um, yeah, definitely, definitely want to write a book. I just, just haven't got the, the time at the moment. But it's all up here. <laughs> I just need the time to take it from there onto onto paper, and then um, yeah, it would be there. <laughs> but it will happen. Just just not 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 next month. <laughs> Alrighty. The final question is: What advice would you give someone um, at home or someone you know, like um, like you know, a lot of people are stuck at the house at the moment, like there's lockdown in Sydney where I am. So uh, <laughs> how do you minimize waste on in their day to day life? Like one tip you can part like you know that you think people should do this more but they're not doing it because they're unaware or something like that um i think it's uh, the first thing is actually just starting to be basically aware of how much waste you create i think there's a real shift um over the years uh that like well one of the figures from plastic free ocean is that we've created more plastic in the past 10 years than we did in the past entire century we're living a very very consumption based lifestyle which is around convenience and especially now with COVID hygiene and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it just creates masses of waste. Um, and what I, like, one of the simplest things people can do is, um, first of all, recycle properly. So check your local rules on how, what you can and can't recycle because it can be different between councils and regions. And then the second thing is just start an awareness of what you buy. Um, so things like bottled water. I mean, why, why do we need to buy bottled water when you get perfectly good water? water out of the tap you know and if you're really unhappy with that put a filter in you'll save thousands but um you know i think it's just being aware of what we actually buy like do you need bottled water or could you put a filter in if you're drinking a bottle of water every single day that's that's you know basically 365 bottles need to produce in one year you know if you're going in to buy food buy minimalistic packaging so you know get a broccoli that's just a broccoli not in a in a plastic bag you don't need the bag it's just you're going to take it home, chuck it in the rubbish. And and just even looking at things like overpackaged cereals, where the cereal box is like that big, the cereal inside it's that big, and, and it's in a box in a bag. Like if you like muesli, buy the muesli just in a bag, not in a bag in a box. You know, like it just, even though you can recycle the box, you've still got two pieces of, of, of product to try and recycle or try and dispose of. So I think it's just, it's mindfulness is the, is the first thing is just, you know, what are you buying could you do it differently um i mean i had a moment where i thought i'd make my own muesli i thought it would be great i saw this fantastic jamie oliver recipe on granola and so i went to the supermarket brought all the ingredients made my kilo of granola and then picked up nine plastic bags from all the stuff that i'd brought that i needed to put in it and i was like this is ridiculous i might as well just buy a kilo of muesli in one plastic bag you know so it's just it's just being aware because for me i look at the planet and i suppose in the big picture when I was born here we, we lived on a livable planet we could swim in every single river and ocean in New Zealand and uh, basically in one generation it's gone from that to now having like apps in Auckland where it tells you where it's safe to swim um, because of pollution so we got big problems and and the reality is I I was born onto a livable planet and in my generation I'm now hand, handing on my kids and grandkids a massive problem to sort out and um, um, you know, landfills are filling up faster. The ocean's filling up with plastic. We're overfishing. We're overgrowing. We're throwing away huge amounts of food that we buy but don't eat. And we're in this um, in this situation where the, the planet can't sustain the lifestyle we want. So we have to change the lifestyle so that our kids and future generations actually can live here. Awesome. All right. And that is all the time that we have for today. We have just been speaking to Kate Meats of Waste Free with Kate and Co. Thank Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us today. You th Thank you. Nice to, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you. And the pleasure is all ours. Be sure to join us next week where we aim to interview another awesome entrepreneur from across the Tasman. Thank you very much. <laughs>